Center. You may be seated. What a tremendous atmosphere we are in right now. There is, it's nothing short of absolute sacred. And uh, I feel, I feel so pulled into this weekend. I, I was telling uh, Ryan and, and Bree last night when we were having dinner, I said, I, I feel like the Holy Spirit has moved on me in the last two weeks for this weekend in a pretty special way. And so I'm not coming with just some watered down cookie cutter message. No, I came weapons hot. I will feel like God is going to explode. All, I feel like heaven's going to punch a hole in the roof and there's going to be a holy invasion. I'm so convinced of a move of the Spirit this weekend on your life. And uh, I know that there has been a, a, a several that have been fasting and praying and there's just been this corporate hunger. And, and I believe that's a sign that, that God has, has full permission to do anything. And so I, I want to lean into that, but I realized, I think we hijacked the youth night tonight. Is that what we did with all the students? Come on, this is amazing. I love this section over here. This is incredible. Um, I, I, uh, I, I have to say this. Uh, I'm not even sure. I said it this morning, but I'm going to say it again. I, I have the unique privilege to stand in a lot of different environments from churches to conferences to, to boardrooms and and uh, especially in the house of God, I have a, a, a unique calling and I get to stand in atmospheres uh, uh, somewhat like this. But I, I got to tell you, you people are spoiled rotten up in this church right here. You spoiled so bad. Yet I'm telling you, you have incredible worship. Come on, give it up for this worship team. <laughs> Phenomenal. And then you have this next gen vision. Come on, give it up for everybody who's serving and exploring and building in every area from kids to youth to young adults. I mean, it's wild. And I think it's just a, a, the staff, the team, it's just a quality reflection of incredible leadership with Pastor Wayne and Pastor Lynn. Come on, do you love your lead pastors? I honor you guys for the the, honestly, just the relationship that we get to have, but even what you've done in the nations, what you've done in this nation, I don't know anybody that has the capacity that you two have. I'm still blown away by all that God has given you to steward and, and just to watch what he's put on your life. It's inspiring to young leaders like myself, and I, I just honor you. Come on one more time. Can you give it up for Pastor Wayne and Pastor Lynn? Um, I, I, uh, I haven't been here in a long time. I think it's been, well, definitely COVID's happened. The blip happened. So that was about three years. Uh, but let me, let me kind of tell you my story because uh, I recognize I got a lot of new friends in the room. So let me tell you my story so you know where this crazy Mexican is coming from, all right? If you didn't know, I am brown. I am caramel. Come on, any brown people in the room? Where the caramel people? Uh-huh. And we got some chocolate. Where's the chocolate at? Everybody loves chocolate. Uh-huh. And we got a lot of whipped cream up in this room tonight. So it don't matter what flavor you are, all right? But I, uh, I, I grew up on the border of the United States and Mexico, and if you do your research, you probably have heard of my city, but for all the wrong reasons, because nobody vacations in my city. You go there for one of two reasons. You go there, number one, to visit family, or number two, to do something illegal. I mean, that's the only reason. I'm not lying. If you heard about where all the cartel wars, all the drug trafficking, all the human, okay, those are all my cousins. Aha. So I'm not lying. It, 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 I'm, every Christmas, it was either Christmas was fun or the FBI was kicking in the door arresting somebody that I was related to. There was never, I felt like my whole life was an episode of Narcos. That's what it felt like, my whole life, all right? And so you can imagine growing up in that kind of environment by the age of 12, I found myself with a drug addiction, a lust problem, and an anger issue, but I love to play basketball. Come on, anybody love to hoop in here? Anyone love to hoop in here? Yeah, okay, uh, just this side of the church, really. Uh, <laughs> And so I, I would go to this uh, church that had a gym right before their youth service. They would open it up and get all the students into play. And then when service would start, they'd shut the dim, uh, gym down and have all of us go in. Well, I would dip and leave and find someone else to play. I would never go to service. But the youth pastor noticed. And one day he came to me. And he said, hey, do you want to go to church camp? Now, honestly, God, I had no idea what this was. All right. He said, hey, you want to go to church camp? I said, there are going to be hot girls at this camp. It's going to be five women. At the, I was a six-year-old little pervert. All right? I had no idea what I was saying. Okay? And so he's like, well, we're going to go for Jesus. I said, fine. You can go for Jesus. I'm going to get some phone numbers. <laughs> I'm going to camp. What I didn't realize is on the first night of that camp, your boy got saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit, and called into ministry all in one night. 
It's a game-changing night for your boy, and I haven't been to the same since. So from that point forward, I went to Bible college, went into business, was a missionary, have spent the last 14 years of my life raising and releasing this next wave of influencers, which I believe are going to be holy disruptions in every area of society, from politics to education, from medicine to the church. Come on. We need people who are sent into these realms to cause it to grow and go to another level. Come on. Do I have faith for this in the room? And I, I now get to carry an incredible vision uh, at Missions Me where our vision is to unite the global church for the salvation and transformation of nations. And I'll unpack that on another layer tomorrow morning. I'm really excited about that. Uh, but the truth is there's no way I could do what I do uh, alone. I married the right one for me. Uh, uh, her name is Erica. We just celebrated 19 years of marriage, which is a miracle in my family. I have the longest first marriage ever in my family. There's some second marriages that are long, but the longest first marriage in my family. And uh, I, I met my wife in Dallas. She was born and raised there. She graduated high school there. She's a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. I mean, you can't get any more Dallas. Come on, I felt God somewhere in the room. All right, I'm telling you, but I, I uh, and we have four beautiful kids. Uh, um, and I, I love all of my kids, but she wants more. I don't. Pray for her, not me, all right? Because that's demonic. There's something wrong with that, all right? But I can't think of a better place to be than at Counter Weekend at Hope Center. Come on, anybody excited and hyped about being in the building? Now, I, I told you, like I, I told the team this morning, I, I don't do no quiet church. I'm too Mexican for that, all right? We did, Mexicans are the type of people you hear before you see, all right? We just loud. And I need you to talk back to me. Can you do that? I believe the Word of God deserves a response. Hello? Like, I, I believe if the preaching is weak, if you talk back, it might get better. <laughs> not making any promises. I'm just saying it might, all right? But I need you to talk back to the word. I believe that we have to put a pull, a demand on the word. And I want you to do that throughout the entire weekend. Are you with me? Can somebody do that? Come on, can you do that? Somebody shout yes. yes. Say, come on, somebody. Come on. Say, come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to spell that. It's a big word. I don't know how to spell that. Are you ready for the word? Come on, church. I said, are you ready for the word? Yeah. All right. I believe it. I believe it. Do me a favor. Turn on your Bible and go to Luke. I know what generation we live in for crying out loud. Okay, turn it on and go to Luke. Meet me in Luke chapter three. Luke chapter three. Uh, we're going to begin eating tonight our meal in the uh, 16th chapter. Luke chapter three, verse 16. I, I think everybody in the world probably knows John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Like, I, that's probably the most famous scripture across all the text. But I, I love John 3, 16, but Luke 3, 16 to me is just as important because you have to understand what's happening here. The, the, there is this backdrop that we need to paint on in order for you to pull the full revelation out of Luke chapter 3. Uh, you have Jesus who has a cousin named John the Baptist who has been sent in ministry before him to really soften the heart, break up the ground, prepare his arrival as the messianic messenger that he is, our savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, our person who restored us out of darkness into light. What we lost in the garden, he hung on a tree and brought us back in. Where there was sin in my life, I now get to have salvation. Where there was wickedness, I now get to worship. Are you following me? God has reset everything through his son, and he had to do it in such an order. And to precede Jesus, there had to be a catalytic voice, and that voice was his cousin, John the Baptist. John had an explosive ministry, which was completely awkward because he didn't follow the normal models and the normal patterns. No, John had a different, everybody was trying to do ministry in the biggest cities, around the biggest teaching circles, uh, in, the, in the most strategic places of synagogues. But John didn't do that. John was like, I'm going to go to the desert in the middle of nowhere, left of Darwin. You know what I'm saying? Like nowhere. And he's going to be like, I'm going to set up my ministry headquarters there. And only that, if you're going to be a disciple of mine, you're going to have to get used to harsh conditions, radical living, unpredictable schedules. I mean, you're going to eat, you're going to eat wild locusts and honey. You're going to wear camel's hair and a leather belt. He is not a fashion icon of his day. All right. 
This guy, when he gave altar calls, it wasn't like, come on, we love you. We're all family because we love people. No, that's not John the Baptist. John the Baptist was like, you bunch of snakes. Who told you about the judgment that's coming on your life? You better repent. I mean, that's John. And this guy did not care. He, did, he could care less. There was no flex. There was no clout. There was no popularity he was chasing. John was built different. And so the TMZ of the day starts to spread the rumor, well, perhaps John is the Messiah. And this comes back over and over again to John. So John's like, okay, I gotta clear this up. I gotta clear this up. And so John responds and he says this in Luke chapter three, verse 16. He says, John answered them all. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy untie. Watch this. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Watch this. And help me out. And, and, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, I am a firm believer in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. It is not emotionalism. It is not hype. It is a supernatural covenant promise that God gave to us on this side of the cross. It is an access portal to supernatural authority and anointing. It is intimacy with the Holy Spirit. It is walking with God. It is open heavens. I don't, I'm telling you, I make no excuses about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't just stop there. He could have stopped there and it'd been fine, but he says, he's gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, which begs to, you have to ask this question, what is the baptism of fire? Now, I grew up in a Mexican church, a Hispanic church. We're crazy. And that's before we get saved. Imagine what after we're saved. Like, we're wild, okay? And like, there was one word, if you came to the altar to meet with God and someone was gonna pray with you, it didn't matter, male or female, young or old, Church mamas everywhere would be standing here looking at you to come on down this row right here and look at you and they would do this and then they would lay their hand on you and they would say, in the nombre de Jesus. The fuego, fuego de Dios, fuego, levanta. I mean, they would go after it. For those of you who don't know, fuego in Mexican is fire. And I, I, I remember this was constantly shouted, but that is not the baptism of fire. It is not hype. It, it is not emotionalism. It is not, uh, uh, um, it, it is not a, a moment where you come down from a high. It is not any of that. The, pa- the baptism of fire is to have a passionate desire for him and him alone. Where there are no other lovers, there are no other people competing, there is no other opportunities. You only have reserved your entire heart for Jesus and his presence and his word and all things kingdom. You don't have time to mess with low grade, inferior levels of Christianity. You don't have time to be casual. You won't give yourself the passivity. You'll never get familiar with his presence. No, there is a fire that is burning on the inside of you that says every day I've got to have a fresh encounter with God Almighty. We need the baptism of fire. Let's pray. Well, I mean, there's so much here and I want to taste it all like Nando's chicken. I want to taste it all. All right. But first let's pray. Let's pray. Holy Spirit. I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I thank you that you have orchestrated, aligned, strategized, and brought us in to this weekend. And I thank you that nobody's leaving the same. I thank you, Lord, for wherever they have made room, that you would do more than what even they are expecting. Overwhelm us, Lord, with your presence. Overwhelm us with your authority. Lord, let reverent moments turn into radical moments, God. Lord, let moments that mark us for the rest of our lives be started tonight and forever we would be absolutely transformed. Lord, I I speak to this atmosphere once again and I say that you are full of faith.
and you are full of hope and you are full of peace and you are full of joy and I come against every limit, every restriction, every barrier, every lie, every demonic harassment I say is broken right now in Jesus' name and I call every person into their season, Lord. I call them into a fresh outpouring. I say that you're not gonna spend another day in dead, dry, lifeless cycles, God, but we want an outpouring of holy fire on every part of our life. We don't want politically correct fire. We don't want Sunday morning fire. We don't want normal church service fire, God. We don't want reasonable fire or manageable fire. We want a historic outpouring of holy fire to fall on our life and transform everything from Brisbane to Queensland to all of Australia, God. Lord, we don't want fake fire. We don't want synthetic fire. Lord, we don't want cheap fire that draws us away from the real cause of what our hearts burn for, which is your presence, God. Would you encounter us? We want the same fire Moses saw in the burning bush. Lord, we want to walk in the same fire that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had no fear of. Oh, God, we want the God who answers by fire like the prophet Elijah called down. Would you send your fire again? Lord, that we would not make the mistake of waiting for you to move in order for us to respond. Oh, God, pour out an irresistible fire. Pursue our desires to such a place where we, get, we are whittled down to one thing, and that is a passionate desire for you. Move us in such a way, in this order, in the mighty name of Jesus. Provoke us in Jesus' name. And everyone shout it. Amen. Amen. I feel like praying tonight. I want to speak to you from this title. I believe that it's time to be fueled by fire. A lot of people are fueled by life coaching. A lot of people are fueled uh, uh, by a p people's opinions which is really the fear of man. A lot of people are fueled by success and I gotta get gains, I gotta get stacks and racks and I gotta get trophies. And I, I mean, a lot of people are fueled by a lot of things. But friend, can I tell you, of uh, someone who has had the majority of that, I, there is nothing that will give you the type of longevity, the type of authority, the type of revelation, like a fiery moment with God's presence. When you touch his word, it becomes fire in your soul. When you get around people of faith, it becomes fire in your soul. I'm telling you, what we really need is not people who are fueled by opinions and popularity and strategy and structure. Those all are great. But the truth is, what we truly need is people who are fueled by a holy fire. We've got to be fueled by fire. You know, my, my mom was abandoned when she was a little girl. She was uh, uh, 13 years old, and my grandparents abandoned her and, my, uh, and her older sister, my aunt. And, um, and, and, and so there was this couple who had started a home for abused and neglected kids, and my mom was the first kid in this home. This couple would end up becoming what I would believe is my grandfather and grandmother until I was told we weren't blood related. It didn't matter because they functioned in my life as a grandparent. In fact, to this day, uh, my grandfather went to be with the Lord uh, 20, 25 years ago, but my grandmother's still alive. We still call her Grandma Georgia. I have no blood relation of that. I mean, she is Grandma Georgia. And, and I, I, I remember that in order to, to keep the costs down, they had to buy farmland and raise crops and raise chickens. And believe it or not, I know how to milk a cow. I know how to shoe a horse. I know how to shear sheep. Don't let these pants fool you. I'm ghetto, but I'm also a farmer somehow. I don't, I don't, I don't know how, all right? And so uh, I, uh, I, I remember my job when I was a little boy was to, when I went over and spent time with them on the weekends, my job was to feed and water my grandfather's horses. He had, he loved horses and his favorite horse was named Bugsy. I don't know why you would name a horse Bugsy. That's like naming the hamster rhino, right? It's like naming the chihuahua elephant. It doesn't make any sense, right? But he named his horse Bugsy. It was my job to feed and give water to Bugsy. And so one night before I go to sleep, I walk out to the trough and I fill it up with hay and, and then I fill up this big 50 gallon drum with uh, water and I go to bed. Well, the next morning I wake up and I'm walking out and I see this horse in a new position. I had never seen it before. I mean, I'm sitting there, so I'm walking and then I stop and all of a sudden I see the horse and it is killed over on its side, dead like this. <laughs> Tongue hanging out its head and everything, just like this. I'm like this. 
that's not good. That, I'm, not, I'm, not the smart, I'm not the sharpest crayon on the box, but I know that's not good. He said, like this, and I walk over, and what I ascertain and put together is that this horse, I may, I may, I can either confirm nor deny, but I may have put the water a little too far away from this horse, and this dumb horse choked itself to death trying to get to the water. I mean, I don't know if it's murder, assisted suicide. I'm not sure what we're looking at here. But I know that I have just somehow had a way of killing my grandfather's favorite horse. And as soon as he finds this horse, my grandfather's old school. Anybody raised by old school parents? I'm talking about like we had, I'm just telling you right now, I didn't have the type of parents that when you did something bad, we all sat at the kitchen table and we thought about it and we talked about our feelings and what we should do next and how we should approach it and what are we going to do in life and what's the life. No, 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 no. There was no talking, baby. You was catching all the smoke immediately. You was getting hands on top of hands on top of hands. I grew up in the hood where if you was playing four doors down and you let a cuss word out your mouth, the mom in that house would be like, what'd you tell? What'd you say? Would come over? And, and I'm telling you, she would pick you up and she would whoop your booty. I mean, beat you like you're her own kid. And then when she was done or ran out of breath, she would just sit there. Now, you go tell your mama what you said. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right? And you're walking down the street. You're passing the next house. And you're crying. You're <laughs> just like that. And then a, tr a mama on the porch is like, baby, why are you crying? I was over at Miss So-and-So's house. And I said, you said what, boy? Come. And she come down the porch. And she starts whooping your booty. I'm not lying. This is a true story. I got like three beatdowns before the official beatdown. <laughs> Takes a village. I'm telling you, man. So I know when my grandfather finds his horse, he's going to turn my two-piece into a six-pack like that. All right? So, like, I thought, you know what? I, I may have watched one too many mafia movies. So I thought, you know what? If I get rid of the body, <laughs> there's no more evidence. So I thought, what's the quick? Let's burn the horse. Yeah. And if you're judging, listen, if this bothers you, you can send an email to I don't care at ChrisStraw.tv. I was nine and stupid, all right? So I remember, I was nine, mentioned my life, right? So I remember I go and grab all the petrol, all the gas around everything I can, right? And so there's this horse, and I dump gas on the horse, and I like to match it. Whoosh, a little flame goes up. And I'm like, yes! Well, at like two minutes, I mean, the flame goes out. And I'm thinking, it just needs more gas. It just needs a little more gas, right? So, boom, boom, I, I dump a little bit more gas, light a match, whoosh, an even bigger flame. And I'm like, okay, we're going to see it happen. Well, five, seven minutes, boom, this, this flame goes out. And I'm like, this, this dumb horse won't die again. <laughs> like, I, I don't know if you ever burned a fresh body before. It'd be weird if you had. But... Like it, 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 you can't burn fresh bodies. There's still liquid and fluid in them. I'm just, I don't know why this is a master class on killing something, but, but like, I'm from Texas. This is what we do. Like, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, you know what it needs? It needs some help. It needs some wood, some dry newspaper, everything flammable, and the rest of this pile of gas. So I do. I go and grab all the dry brush. I grab and go all the newspapers and magazines I can. I get all the gas. I'm, you know, I'm dumping liters of gas on this horse. And I'm sitting there, I'm getting it over. I mean, it is soaking. You could smell. I'm thinking, it's, I know I had enough sense that if I like this match, I'm going to blow myself to Jesus. All right, like, that's not good. So I dump all the gas, right? I put all the paper, all the wood, and then I get me a little line, and I come out like just like this, just like that, right? And I light the match, and all of a sudden, whoo, shows a big flame goes up. I'm telling you, you could see this thing from space. I mean, it's so huge, right? Whoosh, this big flame. Well, I forgot I was in the middle of a dry field. I'm telling you, get ready for this weekend, all right? And so I, I remember I, I, I'm looking around and I catch the field on fire. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna kill more than a horse today. Like I'm, I'm scared out of my mind. And so now I am in the field trying to put out the fire, kicking dirt. I mean, it, it's West Texas, it's desert. And so I'm sitting there and I'm, putting, I'm doing everything. I keep looking back to see if the horse is still on fire. It's still, okay, good. And I'm going back and forth. And by some miracle, like 20, 30 minutes later, I put out the field fire. Well, I turn around 20, 30 minutes later and I look at the horse and it's back down, not gone. I mean, 
I'm looking at this thing and it's like all smoldering. <laughs> There's all this smoke. And through the smoke, I can see this figure of a man appear. It ain't Jesus for all you spiritually weird people. I'm gonna tell you that right now. And it's my grandfather and he was holding a belt. I couldn't sit down for two weeks after that. You know, now as a pastor, I feel like God gave me that life experience. Because <laughs> I've watched this happen in so many people's lives where they love catching fire, but they don't know how to keep fire. They, they like getting lit, they don't know how to stay lit. They like having prophetic words over their life. They don't like coming under the authority of a prophetic word over their life. They like coming to church, ask them to serve, no way. Ask them to give, never. We like catching fire. We like conferences. We like podcasts. We like heavy moments. We like tears. We like joy. But what happens when you leave out these doors will determine what really got on you and what did not. And we're not here just slinging mud at the wall to see what sticks. No, you're going to have an encounter with God that will fuel your life for the rest of your days that you will be forever marked and ruined and you won't even recognize yourself by Sunday night. We have to be fueled by fire. And if you allow me, just journey with me because I want to take you through the scriptures for just a quick moment to show you the significance of fire in the life of a believer. Did you know that fire is God's nature? Fire is a part of who he is. Fire is God's nature. Uh, Hebrews 12, 29. Our God is a consuming fire. fire. No, notice he doesn't have fire. He is fire. I got news for somebody tonight. God doesn't have love. He is love. God doesn't have peace. He is peace. God doesn't have joy. He is our joy. God doesn't have faith. He is. Or in fact, God doesn't have righteousness. He is. There, you're probably asking God for, to give you certain things. He doesn't have things. He is everything. We live, move, and have our being in him. Are you following this? Our God is a consuming fire. His fire is a part of God's nature. Do you remember in Revelation chapter one, verses 14, 15, and 16, paraphrasing here, John has a vision and he writes this. He said, the hair on Jesus' head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. Watch this. His face was like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. Look up at me. This is interesting because you'll find that John is a Middle Eastern man used to Middle Eastern heat and used to a Middle Eastern sun. And he has the comparison in his mind that the hair on his head was white like wool and his eyes were like blazing fire, but his face was shining bright like the sun, as if it was the sun. Have you ever had just a brain lapse moment in your life and looked directly at the sun? And you burn your corner and you, all you see is dark spots everywhere and you swear you're in some Marvel movie. Like it, it's like you're looking directly at the sun and then all of a sudden you, you can't see anything else. Yet John's saying his face looked like the sun, but I could still make out the fire in his eyes. And he says that you are the apple of his eyes. He says he searches to and fro across the earth looking for a heart completely his. Truly our God is a consuming fire. Did you know that his word is like a fire? Jeremiah 20 verse nine says, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name. His word in my heart is like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. Do you remember Luke 24 for, uh, in verse two? He is walking on the road to Emmaus and walks behind Cleopas and the other disciple that's not named. And he says that, or other follower of Jesus that's not named. And it says that he is walking behind them and he overhears them talking about the current events of the day. And Jesus, knowing that they're talking about his death, his burial, his resurrection, asks them, what are you talking about? And they they're turn around and go, are you the only one in all of Israel that doesn't know? And Jesus like, hit me, baby, tell me more, right? And so now they start telling Jesus about Jesus, right? Which is so, so weird. But he was, remember the Bible says that he was shielded. They were shielded from knowing that it was Jesus, then they get to a certain point where Jesus hijacks the, the conversation and the Bible says he begins to, to uh, teach them and open up the scrolls from the, prof, the law, the prophets to present times. 
And then they're at dinner with him and he's still teaching them and they recognize it's Jesus and then he disappears. And what do they say after, they, after he disappears? Did not our heart burn within us when he spoke these words to us? His word is like a fire. Psalms 119, 105. Do you remember this? His word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. What's a lamp? What's a light? It's church. It's his word is truly a fire. Did you know that his angels are like fire? It says this in Psalms 104, verse 4. It says, he makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. In 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha is completely surrounded by an enemy army, and he is not intimidated. But his servant is completely overwhelmed with the fear of dying. And noticing this, he prays, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And immediately he starts to see what the prophet sees and is no longer intimidated or scared because it says that the hilltops and the mountainsides were full of chariots and horses of fire. Are you seeing this? Did you know that his people should be on fire? It says in John 5 verse 35, John was a lamp that burned and gave light and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. Luke, uh, Luke 12, 49, Jesus quotes, or quoting Jesus, he says, I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it was already here, already kindled. Luke 12, 35, he tells us, be dressed and ready for service. Keep your lamps, the fire on the altar of your heart. Keep your lamps burning. My question to us this weekend is, do you have this kind of fire or is your cell phone still brighter than your fire? Because if you're overwhelmed with anxiety and you're overwhelmed with depression and you're more impressed with headlines, newsreels, social media feeds, opinion polls, and culture wars, it's probably because you're not carrying authentic fire. You've got Sunday morning fire and you've got a midweek something in there and maybe you touch your Bible once or twice, but friend, do you have the type of fire that causes you to see his angels dispatched on your behalf? Do you have the type of fire where it feels like it's shut up in your bones and you can't do anything but release it out of you? Do you have the type of fire that causes you to radically pray about other people and never about yourself because you know God's got you? Do you have this kind of fire? And if we're going to be fueled by fire, I want to give you three things tonight. Three things. God, we need your fire. I feel this in my spirit. We need your fire. And the truth is, if we have no sustaining hunger, I know you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. I know you speak in tongues, but you have no sustaining hunger. You don't have no passion and desire. God's competing with, between his presence and your next promotion. You're fueled by the wrong things. It's not that you don't love God. It's not that you don't even honor God. It's just that he doesn't have all of your heart because you've kept back pieces and parts of your life. And it's masked well enough in your Christianity and all of your Christianese and all of your church sayings that no one would know. And the truth is you call it wisdom and you call it strategy. But the truth is it's the fear of man, the fear of humiliation, the fear of rejection, or the fear of failure. Friend, you're fueled by the wrong thing. When your life spiritually has turned to plastic and shallow, it's time for God to dip you in holy fire so that you are forever disrupted and will never be the same. God, we need your fire again. We don't just need good preaching. We don't just need the next song that makes the world cry. We need it dripping with the anointing of Almighty God that a holy fire erupts on the inside of somebody's life and they're forever changed. God! We need your fire again. I don't need one-liners. I don't need to be life coached. I don't need another book. All I need is the fire of Almighty God. I don't want something trying to pour cold water on the flame that he's put in me. I don't want somebody trying to journey me out of it. Friend, if you don't have fire, get out the way. Because I came for one thing, and that is to leave a trail of blazing fire everywhere I go, in every nation, in every city. God! We need your fire again. This is not called experience weekend. This is not called uh, uh, your uh, exposure weekend. This is encounter weekend where you're going to get a touch from almighty God and you're not even going to be the same. I'm telling you, when you get home, 
The family that didn't come with you doesn't know what's coming back home tonight. There is somebody who has caught a glimpse of the torch of God and has been touched by the fire. We need fire again. And if we're going to have the life, the fueled by fire type of life, I want to give you three things. The first one is fire will transform you. I'm going to say this again. Fire will transform you. I, I, I love Malachi chapter 3 because it gives us a great picture of this. He says, and I'm going I'm to paraphrase this, but he says that he is going to come and purify his sons and daughters. And he's going to use his Holy Spirit to do it. But he, he likens it to, I'm going to purify them as, a, as with launderer's soap purifies somebody's garments. He says, I'm going to take them and put them and purify them like precious metal in a refiner's fire. Now, my, my family, my brother-in-law has a bunch of gold and silver stores, and sometimes he will get gold in its natural state. And gold in its natural state is never found just like gold. Let me, let me just drop some science knowledge on you just for a second, okay? Gold, when it's normally found, is found as an alloy, which means a collection of metals. So it's never just found as gold. It's got copper, zinc, and nickel dominantly attached to the gold. And so if you want to get the, the highest value for the gold, you have to take it to a refiner. And that refiner has all the right equipment. It, has, it knows all the right steps to pull the, uh, the top value out of, that piece of, uh, out of that chunk of gold. So you take that alloy and you bring it over to a refiner and you say, man, could you give me the best that this gold can offer? And he says, absolutely. So he goes and turns up a hot oven and, and really gets rock melted to enough where it's like lava, where it's like molten rock. And what he does is he gets it to the right temperature. And then before he adds the gold, he always has to add a separating agent called flux. P-H-L-U-X. And this agent, this separate agent, can withstand the heat of the fire, but it can also do its job and remove all of the impurities. And so he gets everything good. He gets the fire heated up the right way, gets the rocks melted. He gets the flux spread evenly, and then he drops the gold. Once that gold, boom, goes in the fire, he never takes his eyes off the gold. Not one time. And, and he'll start to see flux start to do what it does. And it separates. So here's, here's some copper. And he puts copper in one pile. Nickel in another. Zinc in another. And he knows that with every scoop, he is increasing the value of the gold. And you know when he knows he's done? He knows he's done when he can see his reflection in the gold. I hope you're hearing me with spiritual hearing. Because God has brought you to Encounter Weekend a refiner's fire. And he has sent his Holy Spirit to separate things from your life. You thought you were coming in here just to get things added. You're gonna probably drop some spiritual weight tonight because he's gonna separate some things that you thought you needed and you never needed in the first place. And he's gonna begin to remove all the things that devalue you in his eyes. He's gonna remove all of the addiction to, to accomplishment. I'm talking about all the, the desire that's in the wrong direction. And when he knows with everything he moves, he is increasing. You know when God knows knows he's done in your life when you look just like him in the reflection in the gold fire will transform you I, I think what happens is a lot of us we avoid our fires God don't put me in the furnace I cry out for fire but I don't want fire we, we avoid fire it, it, it's the real tr truth of it is People don't want to be in their fire because they're afraid of what comes out in the fire. I got news for you. What comes out in the fire stays in the fire. Do you remember Acts? In the book of Acts, it says that, that Paul is shipwrecked. He grabs a bushel of reeds to make a fire. When he goes to the small fire he started, the heat of that fire moves through that bushel of reeds, and a viper was in this fire. And now because it felt the heat of these reeds, it latched, it saw Paul, and the Bible says it strikes and latches to Paul's arm to the point where Paul can't get it off. You know what Paul did not do? Paul did not take out his iPhone 14 and sit there and go, oh my God, I can't believe my life. It totally sucks. I can't believe this is going on. Oh, I hate this. What do I do? What filter? You know, like nobody, he didn't do that. That's not what he did. He's sitting there. It literally says a viper lashes arm. He just, what, it came out of the fire. He just takes the snake and throws it back in the fire because what comes out of the fire stays in the fire. Do not avoid your fires. Can I, can I take this a little deeper? Is that okay? Can I do that tonight, Hope Center? Uh, you can't live off of somebody else's fire. <laughs> uh, 
try, go, go through a 2020 again. Trying to live off of somebody else's fire. You won't make it. There's a lot of people that didn't. You can't live off of other people's fire. I always challenge people. I, I think that we are living on so much second and third head revelation that we have gone anemic spiritually. And we have no more worship endurance. It's amazing how we can barely get you to 35 minutes of worship, but you can scroll for four hours on TikTok. That doesn't make sense to me. Where's the fire? Uh, I, like, if, it, it makes no sense. If you know more Maverick City than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you live off of somebody else's fire. If you have a favorite preacher, but not a favorite scripture, you live off of somebody else's fire. If you can quote somebody's tweets, but you can't quote the sacred text, friend, you live off of somebody else's fire. Fire is supposed to transform you. And if you start to feel the heat of it, you know that shifting and changing and pivoting is going to happen in your life. But many times, some of us are too church and we, get, we think we're smart enough to outmaneuver God when really what's happening is we're causing the flame in our life to go dormant. And the transformation, although once wide and big and evitable to everybody now, just looks like Sunday church. Fire wants to transform you. Here's the second thing. Fire changes everything. Fire never leaves anything the same. When something has been touched by fire, you know it. When lightning strikes a tree, you know it's been struck because there is a scorched part to that tree. When a home or a building was damaged by fire, you know, because there are burn marks left on the fire. When somebody touched a hot fire or an iron, you know there is a scar because it, fire changes everything, including attitudes, behavior, habits, mannerisms, desires, hungers, thirsts, wants, needs, decisions, I'm telling you, destiny, direction, fire has the final say on everything in your life. He's not just Savior. He's not just your best friend. He is Lord, and he comes with holy fire asking, can I rule and reign in your life? Can I tell you where you're supposed to go to uni? Can I tell you what you're supposed to give your life to? Can I tell you what job you're supposed to have? Can I tell you how much you should give? How much you should serve? How much you should lay down your life? Fire tells you who to marry and who not to marry. Fire, tell, I'm telling you, listen, I, I'm helping some single people out right now. I, I feel this. It's a, if I could just have a youth ministry moment. I'm in, a, I'm in youth ministry now 20 years. This thing doesn't leave you, right, Pastor Rain? It doesn't leave you. I'm telling you, like, I love I, all the ladies, especially under 21. Come on, where are the queens at? Make some noise. Where are you at, under 21, lady? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah, okay. We hear you. Go ahead, queen. You know, it's amazing what you post online. <laughs> it got real quiet. They're like, ah, yeah, I'm a quit. Wait, what? 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 You know, like, it's amazing what you post online. You will literally be posting pictures like this. <laughs> yeah, it's getting real. And then you put a scripture in the caption. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But then we also hear you saying, where the real man of God at? I need a man of God. I need a Boaz in my life. I, I need a Jesus man. I need a godly man. Where the real man of God? They know not to be around a Jezebel like you. I'm going to tell you something, something I've told my own daughters. I have two daughters, all right? You are a princess. You are a daughter of God, and you should never be low-grading your life to allow some confused little boy to come into your life and mess you up. If you have to do that, go ahead and keep your crown high, because if, your crown, if, your chin, if you don't keep your chin up, the crown slips. I'm helping you out. 
Come on, we're under 21. Where are the kings at? Come on, kings. Make some, hey, come on. Some of you don't even want to. You're like, oh, God, he's coming for our neck tonight. <laughs> come on, kings, where are you at? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think one of the greatest things you could do for revival is be single. <laughs> it's, no, it's like, I'm, I'm glad we took up the offering before. I'm just, I'm just helping you out. The truth is, you're still looking at stuff you shouldn't look at. You're still sending messages you shouldn't. You're still asking for pictures you shouldn't be asking for. And then you're over here complaining about, I don't know who I am, because you don't know who you are without somebody hanging on your arm. What you need is a single, just a single season between just you and God, and he can add so much identity and so much destiny that you pick up a rhythm and a pace, and you are just running after the things of God. And because there is nobody that can keep up with you, it is very clear who's supposed to be in your life and who's not. But there will be a day where a cutie runs right next to you, and she outruns you, she challenges you, she prays for you, she encourages you, she sharpens you, she corrects you, and she keeps you. I'm getting somebody married by the end of the weekend. I'm telling you right now. It's going to end in a wedding, just like Revelations. <laughs> Fire changes everything. I had a young man in our, our student ministry. His name was Fernie, uh, Fernando, but we called him Fernie. And, and, and Fernie came from a background of church that they did not believe in signs, wonders, healings, and miracles. But he knew he was supposed to be in our church. I was like, God is so good to me. <laughs> and so I, I remember... Uh, Fernie would come out on our fire teams, and these were teams that we would pray and ask the Lord for words of knowledge, and he would tell it, he would give us a location, he would give us somebody's name, he would give us what they're wearing, and he would also tell us what they needed to pray for, and then we always left room for creative words, like, that might seem abstract to us in that moment, but when we find that person, it's going to make sense. I can't tell you how many times we got all these different, what we would call clues, and we start going into the city. God would say, go to Woolworths and look for somebody dressed like this. And so I remember one day, the Lord says, go to this one store, this uh, Target. You guys have Target here, right? Yeah. So um, I remember, sometimes you don't know. <laughs> so like, I, I remember uh, we go into Target. It was like nine in the morning. And I guarantee this was like the only Target on planet Earth that didn't have anyone else in there besides us and the people working. It was, it was weird. Because I walk in there and the, the female population in Target is really high. There's no one in this Target. I can't, we can't find any. We are walking back and forth. Nobody's in this Target. And so finally, I'm like, okay, well, uh, we're just going to wait here because I know God told us to come. Because he told us, go to Target. You'll look for somebody. Uh, I, it was a woman. I can't remember her name. And she's going to be wearing her pajamas. And she is having night terrors. So I remember we're looking, looking. I mean, 30 minutes goes by. By this time, we're playing with the toys in the kids' aisle. We're so bored. <laughs> And this is a true story. I'm a kid at heart, so I'm like, I'm going to do something fun, right? So out of, out of the corner of our eye, we see a woman walk past, and we're like, hey. So we go to the bigger aisle, and we look down, and of course, it's a woman. She's dressed in her pajamas and looks like she hasn't slept in days. So we walk up to her, and we said, excuse me, ma'am. Um, listen, we're Christians, and God speaks to us. And he told us that, and this is Fernie and I, the guy who doesn't believe in signs, wonders, healings, and miracles, but he's in my youth ministry. And so, like, I remember we walk up, I said, Miss, Miss and ma'am, uh, God spoke to us, and he told us to come here. I'm showing her the clues on a piece of paper. I'm like, he told us to come here, look for a woman dressed in her pajamas, uh, and, and then she is having night terrors. Is your name this? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, listen, you're on God's mind. Can we pray for you? When I said this, this woman started manifesting a demon right here. I said, can we pray for you? And she goes, ah, nah, nah. I mean, she just starts going. I'm telling you, I mean, demon juice is going everywhere. She's spitting. And I'm a germaphobe. Like, I don't play all that. Like, I don't drink after people. People don't eat off of my plate. I, I kiss my wife in tongues, but I will not drink after that woman. That is wrong. I love my babies, but I will not drink after those nasty gremlins with all the backwash. I'm not doing that. So this lady's like, ah, ah, ah. Fernie is like, ah. Of course, I'm not paying attention to Fernie because I know he's going to act like a sissy right now. So, so like, I, I'm thinking, God, this is great. This is a, for Fernie's formation spiritually, this is what we needed. Fire, right? So she's like, ha, ha, just like this, right? Well, then all of a sudden, I come over and I said, Fernie, come over here and cast out this demon. I, 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 don't, know, I don't know how. I don't care. 
Come over here and tell it what to do. Tell it what to do. Tell it what to do. What do you mean tell what to do? You tell it if you want it to do a cartwheel, it's supposed to do a cartwheel. Right now we want it to leave. So this, this is a good, I need you to journey this right here. Fernie, come. He's like, ah, ah, and this lady's on the ground. I mean, she is slithering like a snake in the aisle. This, the true story, right? Like, sitting around saying, here's the, ah, ah, and I'm like, Fernie, you stop being a sissy and you start believing the word of God and you deal with this devil. And he's like, ah, 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 ah. I mean, he's like, like locking up. And I'm like, you will not be passive. You will see the kingdom of God come in your own day, in your own eyes. And this is the beginning. Cast out this demon. And finally, Fernie's like, in Jesus' name, out. And he just yells out. He doesn't say come out, let go, loose it. No, no, King, G, no King James here. It was out. And I'm like, yeah, just say it again. I'm like hyping him up. Like, I'm, I'm like, you're gonna get it. You're gonna, don't worry. I'm gonna, you're gonna get it. Dude, come on, hit it. Woo, hit it again, right? Ow! And then out of nowhere, like, you could feel the authority. Like, come out in Jesus' name. And it's like, pow. It's like somebody smacked this woman, boom, on the floor, and she just goes limp like a fish. Dead fish. <laughs> well, wouldn't you know? 20 people out of nowhere come to watch two Mexicans standing over a woman yelling, out! One of them is freaked out while he's yelling. The other one is hyping up the situation. Yeah! <laughs> 20 people. And I go over and I start praying for the woman. I don't know if she's dead. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, this is new. So I go and pray for her. Well, I go and pray for her. Fernie turns around and I don't know with authority says, this is a sign that God is freeing people from demons, from sin, from adultery, from idol worship. And if you need to give your life to Jesus, you better surrender now. Is there anyone watching this who wants to surrender life to Jesus? I mean, people start crying. People are like, this is me, man. I don't know why. I just felt like coming to Target, but I didn't know we were going to do. Like, I, um, people are People getting saved, people getting filled with the Holy Spirit, and one woman that finally comes out of whatever death stare she was in and comes to and gets totally free, she was having night terrors because her grandfather, uh, who was her favorite person on the earth, was sick in the hospital. And so we prayed for him. Two weeks later, we got a text saying he got radically healed and is out of the hospital completely free and healed. I look at Fernie's life and I'm like, fire changes everything here's the last thing the last thing you know I think we talk about fire and you're like well how not only do I how I get it but how do I keep it and and to the mature in the room it's not just how do we keep it how do I intensify this how do I grow this how do I build this more on the inside of me I'll tell you I'm going to paraphrase this for time Matthew 25 this is this is the, sorry, I had some Nando's earlier today. Uh, I, this is, this is the, par I did, this is true, I door dashed it to my room. I'm going to confess that right now in front of everybody. But, Perry Perry sauce, woo! <laughs> Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. Jesus tells this story. Like, he, I don't know where this man will break in the stories in the Gospels. It's just like, there was a certain man, there was a certain son, there was a certain city, there was a certain time. You know, I went to preach at a conference, and they're like, Pastor Chris, you tell too many stories. I'm like, have you, like, read the Gospels? All, all this man did was interrupt thoughts and arguments with, there was a certain man, there was a certain son, there was a certain city, there was a certain time. I'm like, all he did was tell stories. Jesus goes on one of these moments. He says, there was a certain time where there were ten virgins. Five were foolish. Five of them were wise. And the foolish ones go out and recognize that these ten, all ten recognize that their groom could come in the middle of the night. So the, the five foolish ones know enough, like, I need to get a lamp in order for me to see in the night. Because if my groom comes, I want to be able to go out and meet him. Right? So, so sure enough, they walk into a store and they buy a lamp. Just, just a lamp. And then they go home and they're great. They feel great. The wise ones, the Bible says, walk into the same store and they buy a lamp and as much oil as they could afford. And then they go back home. Well, sure enough, the groom comes in the, the grooms come in the middle of the night. And now they can, the foolish ones can't light their lamps. But the wise ones have no problem. 
And so the foolish ones are seeing that they can light their lamps, but they can't light their own. So they're like, hey, hey, give, give us some of your oil. And the, and the wise ones are like saying, we can't. And they're like, no, give us some of your own. No, we can't. Why can't you give us some of your own? And they, the wise ones say, because there may not be enough for you and us. And then they say this, go and buy some for yourself. Let me, let me, I'm a hunter, if you haven't, I'm from Texas, this is what we do, all right? I, 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 most of the time when I'm going out to the deer blind or the duck blind, it's very early in the morning, it's still dark outside, and I need a torch, I need a lamp, I need some type of head, to, I need something, a flashlight to be able to see, right? And so I, to these, to the foolish ones, it's like walking into a, a famous hunting store in America, it's called Cabela's or Bass Pro, right? And so you walk in and, and the foolish ones say, hey, I'm going to need to see in the dark, and I need one lamp. They're like, how much is that one lamp? And they're like, well, it's this much. Are you sure it's this much? Like, I don't want to give up any more than that. I don't want to sacrifice any more than that. I don't want to be asked more than that. Don't, don't come at me for more than what you're telling me right now. I just want my lamp, just a lamp. And they're like, well, this is all you have to pay for the lamp. Okay, good. And they take their lamp, they go home. The wise ones walk into the same store, go to the same counter, talk to the same cashier, and say, hey, I need that lamp, and I need as much oil as this will buy me, and they empty out all the money in their wallet. And they went and sold the house, the cars, the boat, the motorcycle, everything of value they went and took, sold it, and put everything of value on their life. They sacrificed it all and said, I need one lamp, and as much oil as this will buy me, and they're all in. And then they get a, they get a lamp and oil, and they go back home. Are you seeing this? And then 2020 comes. And then geopolitical situations happen. And then offenses come. And then lies, church splits, betrayals. I know I'm getting warm. You lose your job. You lose a loved one. A church member hurts you. You got hurt by another church, and you brought that pain in here, and now they're having to minister through walls that you created. That's all you do. You, 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 and, and now, watch this. They go and they give everything. They go home by their lamp, and then darkness comes on their life. And when they expect to see in the dark, they can't because the anxiety, the depression, the lies of this culture and this age, the spirit of this world is blinding the minds. Like it says, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it is dark and they can't see. It, it's, it's interesting. They both bought lamps, but one bought oil and the other didn't. You know, I have been in a lot of rooms like this and everybody in this room, it's amazing how we will come to a moment where we're going to encounter God and purpose our hearts under this word as he's ministering to us. We're going to answer this altar. We're going to come up. We're going to see God move. And it's amazing how I will have two people come up. They both sat in the same anointing, heard the same worship, the same message, got prayed for by the same person, stood in the same moment, but one leaves with oil and the other doesn't. I, I'm amazed by this. In our own church, I've watched this. In our, uh, as I've traveled around the world, I've seen this millions of times. People just come in. It's amazing who gets oil and who doesn't. And, it, and you know what's interesting? It's, it can't be seen. It, we won't find out who buys oil until three months from now. We, we won't. We won't be able to tell who bought oil tonight until a storm comes. Until a Goliath shows up. Until a struggle is exposed. Uh, I'm talking about when you have the opportunity to get back at somebody. And now we're going to find out how much oil you bought. It, it's, it's interesting to me how many people come up, but some leave with oil. Majority don't. So we have to go back to this statement. Foolish ones are panicking. We can't. We can't light our lamps. I don't know what I'm going to do. There's a pandemic, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I lost somebody very close to me, and I don't know what to do. The finances aren't right. My money's not right. I don't know what I'm going to do. 
My friends are turning their back on me. Betrayal's all around me. I don't know what I'm going to do. They can't light their lamp. I go to church, I feel nothing. I talk to pastors, I feel nothing. I Google it online, I still feel nothing. I don't know what to do. They can't light their lamp. But they notice that there are some who have a burning lamp that have protected and kept the altar on their heart burning. And then they look at them and say, we want what you have. Give us some of your church. Give us some of your teaching. Give us some, give us some of your oil. And they're like, we can't. There may not be enough for you and me. And then they say this, go and buy some for yourself. So it begs this question, how do you buy spiritual oil? What currency do you use in the economy of God to buy holy oil? Friend, there is only one currency. There is only one thing that you will lay down in your life. One thing. The only way you buy oil is with surrender. And if we're going to lean into this full weekend, we cannot bring yesterday's trash and two weeks ago problems and 40-year-old struggles into a fresh encounter. We have to do business with that tonight. There's got to be surrender. There are secrets you have kept in your marriage. And it has hindered you from having authentic intimacy. But tonight, under the gentle, loving atmosphere filled with fire, you will finally be able to expose that chain around your neck and you will surrender and you'll watch the mercy of God collide with your pain. I'm telling you there's surrender in the room. God didn't bring us all here so that we could get another spiritual goose bump and feel tickled. I can make you laugh all weekend. I'm dumb. Like, I, I that's my wife. I have the spirit of stupid. There are things she's like, you did what? I took Pastor Wayne and Pastor Lynn to a Macker's for lunch in Dallas. Now, truth be told, I tried to take them like two other places, but they were closed. And they said they were open on Apple Maps, but who trusts that anymore, right? So like, my bad. <laughs> like, I do things you're just like, you did what? You did what? I remember telling my wife about Fernie, and she's like, you did what? I'm like, yeah, he's being a sissy, but we got this. <laughs> she's like, I don't, I don't get you. I, I'm, I'm only telling you this. I, I'm not the reason you're here. He's the reason you're here. And he will be the reason you remain. But you will not keep anything out of this weekend if you don't yield everything tonight. I'm telling you, you have nothing else. It's Friday for crying out loud. You ain't got nothing else to do except be with God. There ain't nothing going to be open after this. Nothing you need to go to. But there is a sacred portal moment where you could surrender. And instead of just buying another Friday night going home and binging on whatever you see on, on whatever streaming platform you have, you could stay in the presence of Almighty God. And He would not only cause you to surrender, He would soothe, minister, encourage, strengthen, build, correct, sharpen, discipline, develop. I'm telling you, He could do it all. What could God, I like that song, imagine what God could do with all the faith in the room. Uh, if I could just add one more line. Imagine what God could do with all the surrender needed in this room. You're not here because you're perfect. You're here because you're hungry. You're here because there is a longing. John's disciples were like, how come your disciples, Jesus, don't fast? And, and Jesus is like, I'm, I'm here. Why would you fast when the bridegroom's here? I'm here. But then he says, there's coming a day. Well, they will mourn because the bridegroom will be no longer here. What's he saying? He said, let me put this in your world. I don't, you don't need to fast physically because I'm here. If you need something, I'm right here. God represented on the earth in Jesus' day was Jesus. But he said, there will come a day where I physically will be taken, but I will send the Holy Spirit. And, he, and then he says, they will mourn for me. That's not a, oh, we're so sad he's dead. He's not dead. He's alive. 
what he's saying is you will long for me you will come to a place where you will desire me you will be so lovesick that you have to have him because nothing else does it you you are so moved and yet at the same time you want to buy oil with your surrender there's only one way you have to yield lay things down purposely put them to God God I give, I cast my cares I cast the pain I cast the trouble I feel like we're going to have this moment would you stand up with me